Yeah, Richard, you want to take a chair up here? Delegates, can we please hurry and take our seats? We're about to commence. Thanks, delegates. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the meeting today. My name is Marilyn Isanch, and I'm president of Unions New South Wales. Before I start, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land where this meeting's being held today, which is the Gadigal people of the Aura Nation, and we pay our respects to their elders past and present. I'd also like to acknowledge any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island delegates or members that are here today. Um, a big welcome to the delegates who are all of you who are joining us today, both here in the Masonic Centre and at other venues via live video stream, each is Newcastle, Wollongong and Lismore and around New South Wales. Okay, so to sign in for today's meeting, can you please text your name, your suburb and your email address to the number that we've put up on the screen? This is just, rather than circulating uh, pieces of paper for you to sign in, if you could just text those details to that number, that automatically puts that up. So we'll put that number up a few times during the meeting today, and, uh, but we just ask for you to sign in. So the number is 0417 751 595. That's 0417 751 595. We also um, are welcoming today our ambassadors who are usually <laughs> on the screen there for our jobs, rights and services. Um, if you can, guys can come up to the stage, I'll just introduce them. So these are them and they're Chris, uh, Tristan Clark, um, elect electrician, and Martin Dixon is the firefighter, Mimi Chu, registered nurse, and Tiawe Ratawai. Please give them a great hand. <laughs> Actually, we're missing uh, Rachel L. Haig. She's uh, su uh, the supermarket worker from Burwood and she hasn't been able to get here today. So there's the four of us. Thanks very much, guys. Thanks. <laughs> I'm now just going to give you an outline of the agenda today. We're going to keep a time and finish by 1.30. The majority of people have got to work, uh, go back to work at the end of the meeting. So firstly, we're going to hear 
briefly from some workers who have a story to tell about the federal and state governments that are affecting their work, their industry, and the services they provide. We then have a guest speaker, Richard Dennis, from the Australian Institute. Thanks for coming, Richard. Um, we will hear from the Secretary, Mark Lennon, and then from Workplace Delegate, who's involved in one of our local union um, community councils, about the next steps we're going to take. And then we'll have 10 minutes allocated for questions and comments for Richard, Mark, and the panel. Um, I understand that there's a motion being circulated today uh, during discussion time. You're welcome to move that motion. Uh, you'll need a seconder. And uh, the motion will go to Unions New South Wales Executive uh, and the Executive Council. Unfortunately, we don't have a great large amount of time for the discussion today. So next Thursday, the 25th of September at 12.30 at Unions New South Wales in the auditorium, we'll provide a discussion there and a discussion forum about the campaign in the Trades Hall. That's right. We intend to have that. Uh, I'm just saying if there's other motions, um, because of the time limit that we're going to have, that we will have another forum as well on the 25th, which is next Thursday. So uh, before the meeting closes today, we'll also hear the, um, about an ACTU campaign against the reintroduction of the individual contracts, which is currently before the Senate at the moment. So now we're going to hear from some of our workers from the, and their stories. So please come up. Lynn. They're going to introduce themselves and speak for a couple of minutes. Oops. Excuse me. <laughs> almost fell up the stage. It's a very grand entrance. Good afternoon, my name's Lynn Hopper and I'm a registered nurse, work at Manly Hospital. I'm also the Manly branch president of the New South Wales Nurses and Midwives Association. I'd like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of this land. I hope that you've all heard about the privatisation of the new northern beaches as part of the Keep It Public campaign. For many years, we've been fighting for a new Level 5 public hospital on the northern beaches. In May last year, we were told that we would get our new hospital, but it would be private. That the government is going to replace two public hospitals, Manly of 220 beds and Mona Vale of 150 beds, with a privately owned, built and operated 423 bed private hospital, with a minimum 173 private beds, a minimum. At the moment, there are two potential operators, both Ramsey and HealthScope. We all know who they give their contributions to. Uh, so we're currently waiting for the contract to be awarded by the end of the year, and you can assure, be assured that their prime goal will be profit and not good patient care. Basically, there are two models of public-private partnerships, one where the clinical Oh, sorry. <laughs> One where the clinical services are privately operated and the other where they're publicly run. The Royal North Shore is an example of the publicly run clinical services, so that's a public hospital, but other cer certain services are outsourced to the private sector, such as radiology, etc. The Northern Beaches is going to be a full privatisation hospital where beds will be leased back to the government at a cost. This model has been tried numerous times and it's failed. Everyone has heard about the uh, Port Macquarie Hospital. It was contracted to do an 80-20 public-private mix, but um, it privatised in 1994. In 2004, the state government at a cost of $30 million had to buy it back. Just interestingly, uh, the private Port Macquarie-based hospital was running the state's worst elective surgery wait lists. That was the private. Often if the private operator is not making a profit, they ask and expect the government to fund their operating losses. The government has the choice to support the private industry's profit or change the hospitals back to the public, as they've done in Rabina or La Trobe in Victoria. Most recently, the Sunshine Coast University Hospital, which was built and operated by Ramsey, has been taken back as a private hospital in response to, the, as a public hospital, sorry, in response to the public outcry. Campbell Newman said that the government could deliver and run health care more efficiently. Which leads us to our campaign. This is not a scare campaign run by a bunch of liars. 
If the new Northern Beaches Hospital at French's Forest goes ahead, it will be like opening a Pandora's box for this government and the Americanization and privatization of one of the best public health care systems in the world. Already, disability services and palliative care are targeted to be privatised. Apparently, there's money to be made in dying and disability. The government also has its eyes on Maitland Hospital and on the Byron Bay Hospital if the new French's Forest Hospital goes ahead in this role. We need a groundswell to tell the government that we do not want privatisation of our public health system. We do not want Medicare co-payments for GP visits, medications and diagnostic tests. This will only lead to access, decreased access to the health care and people delaying treatments, hence leading to a sick society, particularly in the disadvantaged. If this privatisation goes ahead, patient health care will be under threat. We will lose our hard-fought ratios uh, and we will lose the universal health care system that we have fought for. I don't want to lose our universal health care system. We need each and every one of you to carry out anti-privatisation message, talk to everyone you know regarding this issue and let's change this government in March. Thanks, Lynn. We'll now hear from Ben Lister about the electricity privatisation. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to pay my respects to the traditional landowners. Um, my name's Ben Lister. I was a linesman with Osgrid for 16 years and I was based on the Central Coast. I was involved with overhead line maintenance and construction uh, through to training the apprentices in overhead line work. And I'm also a proud ETU member. The reason I'm speaking today is because of the State Government's plans to privatise New South Wales poles and wires. Uh, the problem with privatisation of the New South Wales poles and wires <clears throat> uh, will be the job losses, the lack of safety and reliability, and of course the price hikes. Victoria is a fine example of privatisation with 80% of job losses in the electricity sector and a lack of focus on safety and reliability uh, played a major role in the black Saturday fires around the King Lake region. The reason I've become active with the Stop the Sell-Off campaign is because of my concern for future generations uh, and that they will be left to carry the burden into the future. In 2007, the Central Coast was hit with very severe storms. Most of the Central Coast was without power and was looking down the barrel of long delays in getting their power restored. The decision was made extremely fast to bring in our brothers from Essential Energy into the region to help systematically restore power around the clock over the next 10 days. <clears throat> if New South Wales was to privatise poles and wires and lose 80 per cent of these jobs, it would simply mean that these regions would be on their own in times of community need. The Stop the Sell-Off campaign is a statewide campaign that we're, we're working closely with the local union community councils in all areas. Uh, the best way to become involved with the Stop the Sell-Off campaign is to attend your local Unity commun Community Council and get involved with the activities. Uh, to keep up to date with the latest news and events uh, on Stop the Sell-Off campaign, you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter and also check out the website at stopthesellof.org.au. I look forward to seeing you guys out there helping us campaign on this issue among others uh, and just campaign for better New South Wales. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Ben. We're now going to hear from an injured worker on the video. I joined the railways in uh, 2004 and you know, became a transit officer and that's so a lot of my role was I was out patrolling in the rail network. And when I was crossing, running across the main road to join her, uh, I've tripped, pretty much put my hand out to brace my fall, all my body weight came down on the one arm and shattered the radial head and you know, dislocated the elbow. Pretty much I could still hear the assault taking place, so I've managed to get myself back up off the ground. 
and uh, proceed over to where the assault was taking place. They've seen me turn up and everyone, everyone, everyone's fled. I remember um, the doctor coming in and saying to David, you won't be able to go back to your job. And, um, and David goes, what do you mean? He goes, your arm's never going to get back to normal. And the doctor walked out, do you remember? Um, and David started crying. He goes, I need to go back, I need to go to work. You want to ride your bike? You love riding. You know, I'm going to be losing all this money, and I mean, I think one of the hardest things was coming home telling the wife that it's like everything's everything everything's going to change. You know, um, lifestyle is going to change. You know, kids' education, schooling. We all work in dangerous jobs. Any job's dangerous. You know, I mean, that's that's a slap in the face for everyone. We're now going to speak, uh, we're now going to hear from um, Taza Teotupo, um, and she's one of the young workers looking for work. Hi everyone, uh, my name's Taza Tuitupo, and I'm 19 years of age. I was born in Australia and I'm very proud of my Tongan heritage. I currently live in Seven Hills with my three sisters, my brother and my dad, who's a truck driver and a member of the Transport Workers Union. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, last year I graduated from the Hill Sports High School and my strongest subjects were history and English. I started looking for a job at the beginning of this year but I didn't get much luck because I'm still looking for a job. Um, I'll do pretty much anything just to bring some money in to help out my parents and to begin being like financially independent. When I look for work, normally I get to major shopping centres and look around the shops for the now hiring sign and just like go in and drop off my resume and stuff. And usually after applying, I didn't get a call back. So I just keep applying, you know. Um, I've only had one interview throughout this whole year. So yeah, when I travel, travel on public transport, I have to pay full adult fare, which makes it really expensive to look for work and to attend training. I did a course in May this year with my two sisters and it cost my parents over $900 on transport and like lunch and stuff. The course wasn't very helpful in the end and we went back to being jobless. I'd like to have the opportunity to work and start a life for myself. We need a government that is willing to help young people find jobs because we are the future of Australia and if there are no jobs, how are we supposed to build society? Thank you. <laughs> Next we have Ray Ann Lee, who's a retail and hospitality worker. Hi everyone, my name is Ray Ann Lee. I'm a 25 year old retail worker and a mother of three. I work at Woolworths and I'm also a member of the SDA. I've worked for Woolies for the last 11 years. I'm studying teaching by correspondence and I'll graduate my degree in eight months. I work early morning shifts and I start at five o'clock and finish at two so I can have time to pick up my children. My husband gets the kids up ready for school and on my lunch break at eight o'clock in the morning, I, get, I drop off the kids at school. I choose not to work public holidays because I want to spend time with my kids and my family. I'm worried the laws will change and force me to work on public holidays. I'm also worried the government might allow Woolies to trade every day of the year instead of keeping the four and a half days we, when the shops have to close. Having Christmas and Boxing Day as a guaranteed non-working day is so valuable to me and my family because we get everyone together, including my kids' great-grandmother and family from Melbourne, Perth and Darwin. Christmas is, t is all about creating lifelong memories. If I had to work on those days, I could, 
I will not be able to spend quality time with all my family. I won't get to see my kids open their Christmas presents. I won't get to go to church with my family. And most importantly, I won't get time to take selfies with my kids, which we all know is very important. I don't want us to turn into a society where family is not important and life is all about working and making money. It's not the Australia that I was raised in, it's not the Australia that I want to live in, and it's not the Australia that I want my kids to grow in. Thank you. Thanks to all those speakers. It's not easy to get up here, and thank you very much for coming and saying things. That's great. Um, please don't forget to register your number at, with the attendance. It's up on the screen again. Now, we're very lucky to have as a guest speaker um, Richard Dennis. Richard is the Executive Director of the Australian Institute. He is a prominent Australian economist, author, and public policy commentator. So please welcome Richard. Thank you. Uh, thank you um, very much for inviting me along. And, uh, and yeah, look, the reason I'm here is to um, uh, is to tell you a different version of, of what we've just heard from uh, from all of the previous speakers. That um, we, we live in a democracy. Uh, we don't live in an economy, uh, and we can shape our country in any way we want. And of course, we can make we can scrap penalty rates. We can uh, we can uh, pay low wages. We can uh, boot young people off the dole. It's a democracy. We can be the biggest pricks we want to be. <laughs> Well, we can. Or we could build the kind of country that I suspect you and I want to build. It is literally in, entirely up to us. Now, unfortunately, uh, there are other meetings taking place in Sydney today and in Melbourne and in Canberra uh, where other people are working on an entirely different plan. There are people meeting in Sydney, Melbourne and Canberra today in order to ensure that, we, that we, we do get rid of penalty rates, that we do privatise uh, essential services, that we, that we cut the minimum wage and that we boot young people off the dole. It's a democracy. It's a fight. And someone is going to win. And someone is going to lose. And I really hope that it's the people in this room who win. But time will tell. Time, our effort, our strategy, our resolve, and most importantly, how we work together. Because the other guys, and they're not all men, but they often are, uh, so I use the word guys generally, the other guys are pretty cohesive. And that's really what I want to talk to you a little bit about today. So let me, let me start by well, firstly saying thank you uh, to these guys, and secondly with an apology. I, I am an economist, I'm sorry. Okay, I, <laughs> I, I can't help it. I, was, I wasn't raised that way, but I was trained that way. And, and economics is, Economics is the cover story for most of the crap that you've been fed. Economics is the cover story for why we have to cut wages. You very rarely hear a captain of industry on breakfast radio saying, well, we need to cut wages because I want to make more profit. They're funny. They just they forget to mention that bit. Oh, we need to cut wages because I want to be more competitive so I can be more competitive and I can export more and I can create more jobs for people. The reason I want to cut wages is because I care about the unemployed. The mining industry, God bless them, they just want to create jobs for indigenous people. And that's, that's why they went into mining. I mean, I, I know I'm not kidding. I've read their website. You know, there's no mention of profit and a lot of mention about indigenous job creation. And they admit they've failed on the indigenous job creation, but if we let them build a couple more mines, they reckon they'll be better at it next time around. <laughs> but this is important. This is not an accident that they talk about creating jobs. I hate to say it, they sound like union bosses. They have embraced our language. They have embraced the language and the messages that we've used for years, A, because they're important to us, but B, they've embraced them because they work. Talking about creating jobs is a popular thing to do. Now, you guys think you want to create jobs and opportunities for young people. Well, guess what every captain of industry describes themselves as? Someone that just wants to be free to create jobs. 
Well, you should laugh. You should, well, actually, you should scream because every time you hear it on radio, you should get really pissed off because they say the way to create jobs is to cut wages and they say the way to create jobs is to privatise things and let the market rip and they say the way to create jobs is to get rid of safety standards and all the other red tape that's impeding their capacity to grow their business. But what my mum hears when she listens to the radio is they want to create jobs. And it's not an accident that they use these crap economic arguments because people are, the public is, interested in creating jobs. They are in interested in opportunity. They do want a really effective health system. They absolutely do. But what the other guys, frankly, are better at is coming up with bullshit arguments to defend the indefensible. No, they, they are good at it. Let's be clear, they are winning. All right, now think about how stupid some of the stuff they get away with. They say, well, we can't afford, we can't afford uh, to pay nurses and teachers better wages. We can't afford to invest more money uh, in, into docks. We can't afford to spend more money uh, on public transport. Why not? Well, well, we don't want to have a budget deficit. Oh, I see, budget deficits are really bad, are they? Yep, yep, and that's why we're cutting taxes. That's why we're cutting taxes. Because what we need to do is cut taxes. Won't that affect the budget deficit? Not the point. Not the point. What we need to do is cut the taxes first, generate the deficit second, and then tell you you can't have your wage rises. You're laughing, but this has worked for 20 years. All right? And, and, and if, we just, if we just campaign for, uh, for better conditions for teachers, better conditions for nurses, better conditions for public sector workers, if we just campaign for those and all the other guys do is campaign to cut taxes, every time they win, we lose. All right? Because cutting taxes creates the problem. The problem is we don't have enough money. Now we're going to have to shed some public sector workers. Now we're going to have to have a private, pri private hospital. Well, why do we need a private hospital? We don't have enough money to build one. Why don't we have enough money? Well, we've been cutting bloody taxes for 20 years. <laughs> we're losing. This stuff works, all right? This is what I wake up and hear on breakfast radio all the time. Increasing wages, oh, that would destroy competitiveness. And if we're not competitive, we wouldn't be able to export. And if we can't export, we'll all be unemployed. So we have to cut wages so that we can have jobs. Well, if increasing wages makes us uncompetitive, what do you think increasing profits do? Strangely, when their profits go up, that never causes a reduction in competitiveness. Australian, the Australian banks are the most profitable banks in the world. Our property manager, you know, Westfield, um, Stockland, these are the most profitable, uh, most profitable uh, property developers in the world. Right. How come when they pay themselves, when they pay their shareholders higher incomes, that's a, that's a sign that things are going well, but if they tried to pay us higher wages, that would destroy the world, that would lead to unemployment? And the answer is because they get away with it. These ridiculous arguments that having cut taxes will now have to cut spending, that, uh, that wages put pressure on, uh, on prices but, but profits don't. They get away with these arguments uh, for the simple reason, frankly, that they've been uncontested uh, for many years. Now, there is a strategy at work here, and if you look carefully, you'll see it. Sounds ridiculous, but, but firms that are allegedly bitter rivals, companies who, Coles and Woolworths, who, who fight each other for market share, and they really do, it's quite a bitter fight for market share, as the, the TWU will no doubt know. Coles and Woolworths, they might, their day job might be to fight each other over market share, but then when they go to the grocery peak body, they agree, oh, we could work together on getting some regulations changed, couldn't we? We could water down the anti-competition provisions. Coles and Woolworths market share in Australia is approaching 80%. The big two in America have got 20%. We've got the most concentrated retail sector in the developed world. Try being a union negotiating against someone with that much market power. They've played for the last 20 years to water down the, 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 the big picture regulations They've bought up all their rivals. 
And yes, and I was talking to the TWU recently, of course an individual union needs to muscle up, engage its membership, get better at negotiating and get better at, uh, at communicating and campaigning. But if the company you're dealing with has doubled its market share in the last 20 years, then you're in trouble. There's only so much one union can do to take on a behemoth like that. But the right are not campaigning to pay truck drivers lower wages. I haven't seen full page ads saying, let's pay truckies less. The right win in an entirely different way. The right win by getting the rules changed in ways that suit them. The right win by ensuring that, that when they win a fight that we should all cut our taxes, they know that means a smaller public sector. When they run an argument that says uh, public investment is wasteful and inefficient and we can't afford it, they know their mates who want to build a private hospital are going to win. So if, and it's a big if, but I hope it comes true, if we're going to turn this around, if we're going to win these fights, we have to see them for what they are. These are big picture fights. There are individual campaigns to protect a hospital, to prevent the sell-off of the electricity poles and wires, of course. But what's the hospital story and, and, and the electricity privatisation story got in common? Right. It's the same problem. It's that the right has won an argument about governments are inefficient and we're broke and we have to sell off uh, the furniture. So I'm getting the wind up, which because I don't use PowerPoint, I think power corrupts and PowerPoint corrupts absolutely. Uh, <laughs> the real advantage is it means I can always say yes, that's the last point I wanted to make and I can, I can actually wind up without all those extra slides. So let me leave you with a little bit of economic history. If we're going to win these fights, Yes, we need to mobilise. Yes, we need to work together. Yes, we need to see what our campaigns have got in common. And I think it's fantastic that you're all, you guys are all here today and you're on that journey. That's fantastic. But we also need to pay attention to what the others are up to. We need to listen to what arguments they use that work. And it's not an accident that they talk about jobs all the time. It's not an accident they talk about deficits all the time. It's not an accident that they talk about cutting taxes all the time. Because talking about lower taxes and getting rid of budget deficits, that's the easy way to sack nurses. That's the easy way to sack teachers. That's the easy way to privatise stuff. Because privatisation isn't popular, and nurses are. All right? So they never come head on at us. They have to create these dodgy economic arguments. But let me leave you with a little bit of economic history that you might not have heard, or might not have heard in this way. Has anyone heard of a guy called Menzies? Yeah? Uh, pinko lefty communist. Because you know what he did? He significantly increased taxes the whole time he was Prime Minister and he ran deficits for his last nine years that he was Prime Minister. What an embarrassing legacy for a Liberal. Thank you very much. <laughs>
distribution, our ports and our water utilities. And it's also why we have to continue to campaign against Tony Abbott's budget and his legislation that is before Parliament as we speak. And we'll hear a bit more about that before we finish. Let me show you what I think we stand for when it comes to the concept of jobs, rights and service. It's why we campaign on all these issues. You can add more, throw some more in. This is just my list of my thoughts. Why do we campaign, for instance, on the issue of Section 18C and the Racial Discrimination Act and the proposals from the government to amend it? Because we stand up for the right of every worker in this country to go to work or walk the streets of this country and not be vilified or intimidated because of their race. That's what we're about. We have affordable housing up there because every working person has the right to affordable housing. Every working person on a moderate or low income has the right to access housing that they can afford. That was in their cost range. There's talk in this state, already, I'm sorry, in this city. There was a forum this week about the Western Harbour precinct and developing that, that area around the fish markets and Piedmont and thereabouts. Any discussion any discussion about developing that area has to include plans for affordable housing for low to moderate income workers. That's what we say. And there's a favourite of mine, of course, and I'm sure there'll be people in this room with different views, but Badgerys Creek Airport. Two reasons. First and foremost, jobs. Jobs for people in Western Sydney. And the second thing is the people of Western Sydney are entitled to decent services, be that schools, education, roads or indeed an airport. Two million people living in Western Sydney, they deserve an airport. That's why I support Badgerys Creek. But of course, you know, delegates, the Conservatives don't see it this way. They, and when we talk about the Conservatives, all the right as Richard alluded to, they're a mixed bunch. We've got our Liberal politicians like Tony Abbott, Mike Baird, uh, Andrew Constance, that other fellow Joe Hockey, um, and the like. Business leaders like Gina Reinhardt and, of course, Tony Shepherd, And we've got the think tanks out there like the Institute of Public Affairs and the Centre for Independent Studies. They have an agenda we oppose, not because, simply because it's a conservative agenda, because, but because it's not in the interests of working people. And, of course, its most recent face was the federal budget. And we'll talk about, well, we've talked about that uh, in a little while, of course, as well. But for us, the most obvious face here in New South Wales in the last three and a half years has been the record of the O'Farrell Baird government. A government, as we all know, that has slashed jobs, slashed rights and cut services. You can talk about their record. They want to talk about being the government for jobs. Well, you've heard from our speaker about the prospects for her jobs, prospects at the present time. Since they came to power, unemployment in New South Wales has gone up from 5% to 5.8%. And there's 42,000 more workers unemployed in this state than they were when they came to power. They have sacked 15,000 of their own workers. They've cut funding to TAFE. When it comes to rights, of course, they've cut workers' compensation benefits. They've attacked the industrial rights of their own employees. And as you heard, they support proposals to wind back restricted trading hours. And of course, when it comes to services, where do we start? $3 billion cut, cuts to health and funding, privatisation of ports, electricity and water, and of course, closure of fire stations and 800 TAFE teachers sacked. That's just a start. If you want the real record, I, I suggest you have a look at this document that's in your folder. It's called Tracking the Damage. I congratulate my colleagues who put that together, and that gives you a timeline of the Baird government's record. Uh, the Baird and O'Farrell governments, I'm sorry, there's been so many of them come and go. I've forgotten that O'Farrell was there as well. The Baird and O'Farrell government's record. We all know what they're about. They're simply too close to business. One of the centrepieces, of course, of change was workers' compensation change. Had to be done because the, the workers' compensation system was in deficit. We've heard those arguments before. It's, as Richard said, they paint the picture, they create the crisis, and what was the outcome? A reduction in workers' benefits and a 17.5% reduction in premiums for business. Shame. Shame on the government. That's what we're up against. And, of course, that's not to also, uh, that's, that doesn't then go to the question of what we're hearing from employers about the needs to cut penalty rates, about the needs to extend trading hours, of course, about the needs to enhance productivity, which, of course, we know means enhancing productivity means enhancing productivity. We are confronted with the conservative agenda, as you heard from Richard, across the country, which means more flexibility, uh, co more flexibility, which is code for working more with less. 
passing the risk of employment from the employer to the employees through increasingly insecure work. When times get difficult, the only answer for the Conservatives is to cut jobs. They always seem to think that private is better than public, and we know that's nonsense. Workers' rights have to be trashed in the name of productivity and efficiency, as we saw in the case of workers' compensation, and of course, a public sector workforce that is not respected. We have been out there, all of us, campaigning very hard on these issues. These are a number of the campaigns that unions have conducted and continue to conduct in the name of ensuring that working people in this country continue to have a decent quality of life. There's so many of them that they fit on two of our uh, slides here. They all come back to one recurring theme. We're standing up for working people. We're standing up for jobs, rights and services. What we're promising in the lead up to the election, what we're asking is this, and you'll see it in your kits and we'll talk about it in a little while as, as well. What we think to ensure that we can improve jobs, rights and services for, for working people is to ensure first and foremost a fairer tax system and government purchasing policies that reward local businesses and provide jobs and invest in young people. We want to fight for, for and improve public services. I want to, sorry, I just, uh, I'll su we want to support the construction of new roads, schools, hospitals and other public works fight to maintain our weekends and the paid conditions that go with unsociable hours. We want to restore rights for sick and injured workers. We want access to the independent umpire to be restored for public sector workers. We believe housing is a right and will support reforms to make it more affordable and available. And we believe that public service should remain in public hands, including electricity, TAFE, and of course, our public hospital system. That's part of our campaign. That's the message we're taking out there. Day in, day out, as we campaign against the Abbott government, which came against the employers out there and their conservative think tanks that su support them, and as we can campaign against the agenda of this conservative Liberal government here in New South Wales. We will stand up for jobs, rights and services. We have 191 days to the next state election. I want 189 days of action leading up to that election. Christmas Day and Boxing Day, as you heard, should be days off. Fair enough. <laughs> So 190 days of action leading up to the next election, and we're going to hell, hell, uh, sorry, hear now from Narelle Sinclair in one second to give us a call to that action. One last thing, the action, one of the major uh, points of action will be this Saturday. Oh, I'm sorry. And there it is. There is a Medicare rally. And I'm asking people to get along at Manly Park, and it's going to march on Tony Abbott's office. So that's part of the campaign. Narelle, please. Well, this is a tough gig to follow, Mark and um, Richard. Thanks. <laughs> um, my name's Narelle Sinclair. I'm a bus driver out of Brookvale Depot and a proud RTBU member. <laughs> For those of you who don't know where Brookvale is, it's just up the road from Manly, and our local MP, our local state MP, is Mike Baird. We're just down the road from uh, Warringah, who's the local federal MP, is Tony Abbott. So, yeah. so I think we've got a conservative sort of issues going on there. You've heard from Lynn talking about the privatisation of the um, Branches Forest Hospital, which is just up the road. There's a place to do it in. Um, so I'm here today to talk a little bit about the Northern Beaches Community Union Group, of which I'm a committee member, and how I, why I got involved is because I'm lucky enough to live and work in the area. And, uh, and I'm kind of concerned about what's happening in our area. I, I got together with a group of unionists and we sat down at meetings and they told me um, about the privatisation of our public hospitals. They told me about the um, closing of fire stations. They, um, they told me about the cuts in TAFE. So we were, I was really concerned. This is happening to my community, to my kids, to my family and friends and neighbours. Um, and so what did we do is, once we learnt about those things, we were able to engage with the community and teach them those statistics, what it would mean when their kids couldn't go to TAFE or get the course out of TAFE at Brookvale, we had to take them out to West Mead or Western Suburbs, which is another you know, hour and, or two and a quarter hours travel time by public transport. 
Um, uh, so what did we do? We made a launch, we had forums, and we even had a pop-in visit by our local member, Mr Baird. Um, he wouldn't answer any questions. The grinning assassin, we called him. Yeah, I'll come in and I'll, would I do anything to hurt our community? I live here. We saw the pictures in the Manly Daily of him and Tony surfing while our launch was going on trying to save a hospital. Um, so th these are important issues and what, what we've achieved is that we've, the community there, conservative as it is, is starting, is starting to understand. They're starting to realise that this is what this is going on and what's, what's important for them. So now we've got to tell them, we've got to keep these MPs up, to, you know, make them accountable. Don't vote for them. That's what we can do, you know. Don't, don't stand there and say, oh, we don't want all this to happen, but believe the lies and, and as Richard said, the profit after profit after profit. It's not just um, one profit that they're making. It's year after year they've got to increase these profits and they, year after year they're taking it out of our pockets or our services in our areas. So what we can do? This is what I'm here to do today is call a call of action. <laughs> and, um, and in your kits you will find, firstly, there's two things to do. Firstly, we find these. It's to be put up in your workplaces. Across the top there it says, we the workers of, and for example, I'll be saying Brookvale Bus Depot. And we'll get the workers of Brookvale Bus Depot to sign, or sign this pledge, because it's got all these, um, what we fight for, and what we expect of our, our MPs, and what we want our government to look like. And then the fun bit is, we stand there and take our selfies <laughs> and take our photos and we load them up to Facebook and Twitter. So the, all the instructions are down the bottom. It's hashtag jobs, rights and services, but it's all the instructions are down the bottom. So we'd love to get, we put them on Facebook and put them on Twitter and the good people here at Unions New South Wales will make a lovely collage and, and uh, let them know that we're, the public and the communities it, this is what they need to do. The other thing is to get involved in your local community unions. As we've heard today, there are lots of campaigns. What you learn by becoming a member of the local community union groups is the other fights, that how, they, how close they are to yours. Whether it's privatisation, cutting shifts, cutting jobs, cutting services, it all means something to you and your family. So get involved with the community unions. There's a list in your pack again and phone numbers. I know not everybody is as lucky as I am to live and work in the same area, but you, to grow up, and your kids are growing up in that area, to want, have the community you want to live in, get involved and be a part of it. Thank you. It's now time to give the, you delegates the opportunity to make any comments and ask questions to any of the speakers today. Um, there are two microphones, one here and there is one upstairs. Okay, um, so please keep your questions to a minimum and please see your name and your union before you start. You can start lining up um, over at the microphones if you'd like to speak. Um, don't forget that there will be more opportunities for you uh, for all your discussions at the forum next Thursday, the 25th. Oh, sorry. I've just been told the microphone that we're using is over there. Uh, my name is Alma Tolakovic. I'm an admin worker at Sydney Uni. I'm a member of the NTU. Um, I think the first thing that I want to say is that I think it's profoundly disorienting to talk about, you know, a union campaign that's about re-electing the next Labor government when we're facing the biggest budget, the, the most anti-working class budget in 30 years. I think that the union movement should be creating a sense of crisis for the Abbott government. We know how unpopular the budget is. We know how many thousands of people have marched against it. We know. All the opinion polls show people are against all the massive cu cuts to education, health care, um, welfare, disability support, pension. Furthermore, all the anti-union laws, um, cutting the penalty rates to 40,000 hospitality workers, sacking 15,000 public servants. There are numerous, like infinite 
number of examples of the attacks on workers' rights. I think the union movement should be mobilising um, thousands of people onto the streets, thousands of union members in opposition to this. I think polite negotiation, court appeals, you know, sowing illusions in, the, um, in a state election is totally the wrong direction. So my question to Mark Lennon is, Will Unions New South Wales organise a bust the budget campaign that actually involves the anger of the millions of workers around Australia and the thousands of union members that have already marched? Will there be a serious grassroots campaign in every workplace to actually bust the budget? If we can have a couple more speakers and then we'll answer them all together, please. Yep. Uh, my name's Janet Burstall. I'm on Central Council of the New South Wales Public Service Association. Um, I wanted to ask about a longer-term strategy than uh, this, the main point here seems to be to focus on the March election and getting Labor re-elected. But uh, as Richard Dennis pointed out, a lot of what's happening for privatisation is for profit. And I, I'm not sure that I accept Mark, your um, suggestion that it's just that the government is too close to business. The government represents business and the Labor Party hasn't stood against business either. Uh, it's big business that's <coughs> imposing this on us. But, but we also have other ways of asserting ourselves than just by mobilising our community for an, a, anticipating an election to vote against the Conservatives. Uh, we need to work against the employers, in my opinion, and I'm wondering what strategy the unions are looking at for dealing with privatisation, specifically that as a member of the PSA, we're facing outsourcing of, through the National Disability Insurance Scheme, TAFE, um, there's the Northern Beaches Hospital affecting the nurses. All, these, all this work will go to the private sector and it depends on unions that operate in the private sector to take up those jobs. Shouldn't we up, have a lowest common, a minimum standard that we don't accept work being devalued to private or NGO standards from the standards that public sector workers have won? And surely that's a strategy that we could use industrially against uh, the employers who are profiting from outsourcing. And we should be calling on a Labor government to commit to re-nationalise anything that has been privatised. And that you. would lay down a line in the sand. Thanks, Delegate. Can we, can we try and keep the questions to one minute or less, please? Luke, Luke Wayland, Public Service Station of New South Wales. My question is, is Union New South Wales going to be a, just a campaign to elect a Robinson government, Robertson government or a Shorten government, or is the PSA going to, sorry, is Union New South Wales going to show a, a clear direction like what the other pe speakers have spoken about to reverse, uh, put la pressure on Labor, put pressure on the smaller parties to reverse the iniquities pushed by both lots of conservative parties, the conservative Labor as well as conservative Liberal. Thank you. My name is Kate Doherty. I'm from the Public Service Association. And I just think it's pretty disgraceful, actually, that we're looking at a 191-day campaign to an election, when really it's actually desperate that we get out and fight right now. Like, the Abbott government are actually on the back foot in a lot of ways. Christopher Pine is a national disgrace because of his cuts to education. And students have shown the way forward to actually fight. They have called out they're, you know, the National Union of Students have been fighting on campuses over and over again this year. I want to see Unions New South Wales organising a campaign like that. We've got a lot more power as workers than they do as students. Why aren't we actually getting active? Like, the Abbott government has just found half a billion dollars for a war, you know, overseas, and yet apparently they can't fund health and education. <laughs> That's a disgrace. 
And we have an opportunity to fight right now. So I think it's incumbent on Unions New South Wales to actually be calling people to action, real action, not just signing statements, but actually activities in our workplaces on, on, on the streets. Sam Russell, uh, NTU. Um, I wish to move a motion to support um, stopping owners running a deficit in our lives. Um, that this meeting calls on the ACTU and Unions New South Wales to organise a Your Rights at Work style campaign, including regular mass workday rallies and stoppages, and combined unions delegates meetings to oppose the Abbott budget measures. This meeting calls on the ACTU to reverse its decision to cancel the scheduled October 23 National Day of Action. This meeting calls on Unions New South Wales to ensure that a New South Wales Day of Action take place on or around October 23rd and include a significant union stop work action. Bust the budget demands are a major feature of the next New South Wales Day of Action on or around October 23rd. Unions New South Wales call a combined unions delegate meeting within a month after the Day of Action to plan and call on further union stop work action to oppose all aspects of the Abbott budget. I believe this meeting will move us forward by using our industrial as well as our political muscle. So we have had a motion um, put up. Can we have, a, have we got a seconder? Yeah, I, my name's Dennis McNamara. I'm a member, uh, delegate with the CFMEU. I'd like to second the resolution that we've put up. Um, look, one thing all I want to say, guys, is we've never won anything without struggle. We've never won anything without having a fight. These pamphlets, they're full of, we will fight, we will fight. The only way you show anyone you fight is you get out there in the street and you fight. You don't put photos up on the internet, you don't sign petitions, you don't do anything. You get out, you take industrial action and you show them that we mean business. One of the speakers spoke before, Abbott is on the back foot. Every, I think, that Unions New South Wales, not only Unions New South Wales, the ACTU, I think they underestimate the willingness of the rank and file to fight. What we want is leadership. We'll bring the fight to you if you lead us into battle. But one thing we'll let you know, if you don't lead us, we'll have the fight anyway and we'll do it without you. So push forward and keep the battle up, guys. So before we get on to the last question with somebody standing there, the motion has been put and seconded. Is there any opposition and anybody want to speak against the motion? If not, can you please uh, raise your hands if you agree with it? Um, thank you very much. That motion is carried. Uh, we have one more question. Well, I would like to now call on the, the platform. Michael Douglas from the Maritime Union of Australia. Let's hear concretely, given that that's been passed, about what action you're going to take in light of it being passed. Let's hear it. OK, can I thank everyone, because we're running short of time. As I say, we will have a further discussion tomorrow week at Unions New South Wales. Let me just say this. My mistake, I had to rush my presentation because we're running short of time and I speak too much. We are focusing on jobs, rights and services and we are combating wherever that is at threat. We are fighting Tony Abbott and his budget. That's why we want people to come to the rally on Saturday. We are fighting Tony Abbott and his legislation before the present parliament. We are fighting Tony Shepherd and his commission of audit. We are fighting the Business Council of Australia and their proposals for this country. We will stand up and fight wherever we can. We will take action in the streets. We have all in this room, most of us, taken to the streets of Sydney six times this year on a Sunday to stand up for May Day, Palm Sunday, you name it, we stood up for bust the budget. We will continue to do that. That's part of our ongoing campaign. We will continue to get out in the streets. But a long-term campaign, and it doesn't finish in March next year, jobs, rights, services will continue. It goes beyond whoever, whatever the outcome of the election, it will go beyond that election. We have to continue to the campaign and taking to the streets will always be part of our campaign. That's been part of our tradition and it will continue. I thank everyone for your questions. Thank you, everybody. And lastly, we're just going to go to Mark Morey, 
who's just going to finish up with um, some of the Abbott government's uh, introductions. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, delegates. I won't take long. Uh, I know people want to get away. Uh, Monday, we understand a piece of legislation is coming into the federal parliament. The ACTU is running a campaign. This legislation was put in very quickly over the last fortnight. The ACTU have mobilised very quickly. It's essentially a piece of legislation that will introduce individual contracts into employment. The problem with this one is it goes further than the last set that were put in. In fact, it will allow people to trade off their conditions of employment to preserve other conditions. So, for example, if you want to take carer's leave, you may be asked to trade off overtime payments and those sorts of things. It allows employers to do that. It allows employers to exchange payments for in-kind payments. So if you're working at a pizza shop and you do overtime, he may send you home with a pizza for your overtime payments. This is very draconian legislation. It also puts a veto on industrial action by allowing the employers not to negotiate, not to negotiate at all with unions, and therefore no industrial action can be taken. It also moves to allow employers to have Greenfields agreements where if they can't reach an agreement with the unions in three months, they can register their own agreement. That is not fair. Why would an employer find agreement if it can wait three months and then slam something through? The ACTU are running a campaign currently. We believe, as I said before, this legislation will be in the Senate on Monday. We're asking people to email, write, phone, the eight crossbench senators in the federal parliament. We only need three votes from them to block it. Greens and the Labor, Greens and the Labor Party are opposing it. We need three more votes. I urge people this afternoon to talk to people in their workplace about this legislation. Get online at Australian unions, absolutely, brother. But we need to do it quickly and we need to get it done by Monday so if people can go back to their workplaces, report on what's happening and get online and assist. The ACTU are down there lobbying now and it'll be greatly appreciated. Thanks very much. Can I just thank everyone for your attendance? We are always campaigning. We are about jobs, rights, services. We are campaigning against Tony Abbott, employers, Mike Baird, whomever. Let's get out there and continue the campaign. Thank you all for your attendance. Thank you to our guest speakers our, who spoke today. Thank you to Richard Dennis, to Marilyn and to uh, Emma here at the front, and to all the marvellous staff at Unions New South Wales who put this to, to, together today. Thanks very much, and let's get on with the campaign. Thanks. <laughs>